morning. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, uh, why don't we stand and do it? Why don't we do that? All right. If you're there, say amen. amen. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. On his heads, plural. We'll, we'll get into that in, verse 13, in chapter 13. It's going to be interesting. Verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up, to, uh, caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, notice, that she should feed, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. We've been seeing that a lot. Verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. That's where we were last week. Verse 11, and, and it says, and they overcame him. Here's where we were as well. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time, that, excuse me, that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for your word that you had given us, Lord God, and I pray that at this very moment that you would... Uh, remove everything that would hinder us from receiving what you have for us. Lord, the cares of this life, the burdens of our hearts and our minds, and the distractions from the room. Lord, that you would even push back the work of the enemy at this time, Lord, that all of our hearts may be fertile this morning, and that your word would go forth and take root. Lord, that we would continuously be conformed and transformed to the image of your Son that we would grow and, and even this morning leave this place different from the way that we came in, that you would have your way with us, Lord, in these times that we live in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And so for the sake of review, we need to jump in, of course, in verse 12, but for the sake of review, John saw these two images at the beginning of the chapter and uh, a lot of figurative language that we're going to see in this chapter. Um, but we know as Bible scholars now, which is it, what you are, if you've been hanging out here for um, a couple of months at least, you know, you're now a Bible stock scholar. And you know that we always first look at Scripture and take it literally, right? We know that unless there is something going on within the text 
to where we need to take it figuratively and figure out what the interpretation is that we may grow. And these signs, which we've already looked at, remember the woman that we saw in heaven, we've already talked about that. If you've missed these teachings, you can go back and listen to them. But we determined that the woman was the nation of Israel, utilizing this scripture, often allowing scripture to interpret scripture. It led us to the fact that the woman is the nation of Israel. And the child, we determined it then is no other than the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know? Well, one is that this particular child, this male child, is going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And the Bible says throughout that Jesus would do that in his kingdom. So that is yet to be fulfilled, but that time is coming when Jesus will return to the earth and establish his literal kingdom on earth for a thousand years. And we see it being described in very much detail in the prophets, especially Ezekiel. All of that yet to come. And the child was caught up to God in his throne. And we know that Jesus himself is now seated at the right hand of the father on his throne. And at the end of the book of Revelation, it actually describes the throne of the father and of the son. And so we know that the child is Jesus Christ. And then the dragon was the next sign, a fiery red dragon that drew a third of the stars with his tail from heaven to the earth. Threw them to the earth. Y'all remember seeing that? Well, good thing is verse nine tells us who the serpent is. And verse nine, look back with me, says, and uh, I got to get to the right chapter. It says in verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So the dragon here is Satan. His tail threw a third, drew a third of the stars, the stars often representing angels in the scripture. And it tells us that Satan, when he fell, that a third of the angels fell with him. How many of you have read this or heard this at some point? Okay. And that's the picture that's being given to us. So Satan fell and one third of the angelic hosts fell with him. And so what has happened is that we have seen in this chapter this amazing picture that happens because the other image that was given to us is that Satan was waiting to devour the child as soon as the child was born. Remember, the woman was pregnant. Did y'all, y'all heard me read that, right? Okay, y'all doing all right this morning. It's third service. I'm, I'm trying to work through this with you and not keep you here all day. Although it's quite comfortable up here, so I could do that. So what we understand then is this. Satan has been trying to devour the child of the woman since the beginning. Since Genesis, when God said that the seed of the woman that would come, which speaks of the virgin birth, that the seed of the woman would destroy the work of Satan. I'm, par I'm paraphrasing for the sake of time. You can go back and listen. And ever since then, Satan has been trying to figure out how to prevent that seed, first of all, from being born. And so what he do did, has done throughout time is either try to corrupt the seed of the earth so a Messiah can't be born, or to destroy the work of God through the woman to destroy Messiah. We see that beginning in the book of Genesis chapter 6 as he, uh, in the first incursion, corrupts the, the seed of the earth with the sons of God and the daughters of men to prevent there being an opportunity for this promised seed to come. We see throughout time, he's persecuted the woman to destroy her offspring. And we see uh, Pharaoh throwing the baby boys of Israel into the Nile River. Y'all remember reading that in the Old Testament? We, we, we've seen uh, Herod in the Gospels throwing the, or killing the baby boys up to two years old in Bethlehem because he inquired of the priests where the Messiah was supposed to be born. And they said Bethlehem. And so he destroyed the boys in Bethlehem. We saw Hitler destroy millions of Jews as the Zionist movement was beginning. And so we know all of these things. We've seen these things happen throughout history. And so Satan has been up to this. So we get a glimpse into, if you will, behind the scenes, curtain pull, what Satan has been trying to do in all of this time. But see, in chapter 12, we come to what is the midpoint of the tribulation, verses 7 through 11. We saw in heaven a war break out. And Michael stands up, if you remember me reading that, and Michael is called in the Old Testament scriptures, he's called the one who stands up for your people, Daniel, when they told Daniel this, meaning he is the one that watches over the nation of Israel. He's called the archangel and he is the guardian angel we find out 
of the nation of Israel. Side note, um, Jesus even alludes to the little ones having angels that always see his face in the Gospels. Um, in Hebrews, the angels are described as ministering spirits sent forth to minister on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. And that tells us that the angels are ministering on our behalf for God. And even Michael was assigned to the nation Israel. That nation has an angel assigned to them because they would bring forth Messiah and preserve the word of God. They were vital. Israel was the vehicle in which God would bring. Remember, he told Abraham, in your seed, all the earth will be blessed. Y'all know these things, right? And so that's how vital it's been and how important it's been throughout time. And so this war breaks up. Michael stands and goes to battle. He's been waiting to battle Satan. Satan and his one-third angels fight with Michael, but they're outnumbered two to one because only one-third fell. That means there's at least two-thirds remaining, and they kick their butt and kick them out of heaven. That's what happened. That's what we just read. Y'all are looking like deer in headlights, like this is crazy. <laughs> we just read it. I ain't making it up. So we see that happening here. And then there's rejoicing in verse 10 in heaven. We see last week when we were together, uh, we get the victory. Remember we talked about that? We overcome or we get the victory by the blood of the lamb. Remember that? By, the, by our testimony and by not loving this life, this world. We talked about that last week. It frees us up from, from the things of this world. So we looked at all of that. So verse 12 now as we begin today. Notice it says, therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. And now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So in these two verses, we begin to see that at this moment, in heaven, things have now changed. Satan, first of all, has been kicked out of heaven. So all of heaven now is rejoicing. Why is all heaven rejoicing? Well, because in chapter 9, there's no more delay. In chapter 10, the kingdom was proclaimed, right? Remember that? Um, yes, that was chapter 11. Chapter 10, we know that there's no more delay. I get it right in a moment. And in chapter 11, the kingdom was proclaimed. And in chapter 12, Satan gets his butt kicked. He's no longer in heaven. And so as soon as he's kicked out, a party erupts in heaven. That's about right. Okay. <laughs> so heaven is rejoicing. Remember, I told you last week, the good news about this verse, listen, is that the people in heaven who are rejoicing includes those of you who are sitting here this morning who have put your faith in Jesus Christ and those of you who have just this morning put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a part of the number that is in heaven now rejoicing because as we've already read, the church, as we look at it between chapters 4 and chapter 19, the church is not seen on the earth in the book of Revelation, but in heaven with our Lord. Uh, and the Bible tells us that we are to look to heaven for the Lord Jesus to come who will rescue us, literally. It says, deliver us from the wrath that is to come. Why? And that's 1 Thessalonians 1.10 in your notes, if you're taking notes. Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, because we haven't been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. What we have to remember is that the, the coming of the Lord Jesus for the church is what we call imminent. Nothing has to happen before that takes place. Does that make sense? But before his second coming to the earth, at the end of the book of Revelation, a lot of things have to take place. And we can do the math and determine when that will be based upon those things that take place. So just stay with me. Okay. So heaven is now rejoicing. Those who are in heaven, because the time is drawing na near for all things to be wrapped up and Jesus to bring his kingdom to the earth. But notice it says in verse 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, those earth dwellers. Woe to the ones who are on the earth and on the sea. And who are the people who are on the earth and on the sea? Those who have rejected the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of our salvation, and did not turn to him for salvation during this age that we currently live in. This age in which the church has been upon the earth, uh, if you will, representing God and preaching his gospel message. Those are the ones who will go into the tribulation period. And he says, so woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. And here's the reason why. For the devil has been cast down to you, having great wrath. In other words, Satan, generally speaking, and not even in the cartoons, he never seems to be a happy camper to begin with. 
You know, he doesn't seem to be happy, but even more so here, he's filled with wrath. And there's two reasons. One, because he knows that he has a short time. Everything's about to wrap up now. We're halfway through the tribulation. There's only three and a half years left and his days are numbered. So he's filled with wrath. And in verse 13, when he saw that he had been cast to the earth, he is now completely infuriated and in wrath. Now, here's the thing that we got to understand. He's been cast to the earth for some reason. Many times we believe or even think about the fact that Satan, if you will, some people think that he, he dwells in hell where he has a throne in the, in the dark world. That's what a lot of the old uh, mythology movies show. And others believe he's somehow equal with God and the two are against each other as if they're equals. And that's not, that's not the case either. Remember, Jesus created the angel, angels, which means that Jesus created Satan. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so we know that. So neither one of those two things are true. But what is true is that for the last 5,000 980 something years of man's history, I'm talking about biblical history, Satan has had access to heaven. We know he fell in pride and sin. We know that. We know he will eventually fall as he'll be cast into the bottomless pit and then eventually into the lake of fire. But for the last 5,980 something years, Satan has had access to heaven where he has had the ability to stroll the streets and eavesdrop on the plans of God and to go into the throne room. And the Bible told us that day and night he has been accusing the brethren, us, of our sin before God. And Jesus has to remind him of the blood that was shed that paid for our sins. And so the accusations are to no avail. But this is what he's been doing for all of this time. He's had access into heaven. And so we must understand that the Bible describes Satan as this, the prince of the power of the air who now works in the sons of disobedience. So I'll come back to that. In other words, he's called the prince of the power, not of the earth. He's the little God of the earth, but he's ruling somehow from the air. We don't fully understand what that means. It means he has some advantage, if you will, in how he rules in the earth and how he manipulates things in the earth. Stay with me. He has established a very organized kingdom. The Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and hosts of wickedness in what places? Heavenly places. We see that he's established as uh, these fallen angels that are with him as princes over Persia and over Greece in the book of Daniel, which means that he has fallen angels assigned to areas of the earth where he is working as he rules somehow from the air. We don't fully understand heavenly places even. Which means that, as I told you a few weeks ago, there's probably some fallen angel who is assigned to America, to bring America down even. And so this is what we know about his kingdom. He's very crafty, and he's the father of lies, and he manipulates. And so what we know is that Satan rules, the prince of power of the air, who now rules in the sons of disobedience, moving upon the hearts and the minds, and I'm going to come back to all of this later and expound on it, of those who are, if you will, against God or haven't given their lives to God. And I believe that as we move in towards the end of time, there is going to be a growth in deception around the world. Now, we know that God is going to send a strong delusion in the end. But even in these days we live in, it seems as though deception is growing. Demonic deception is growing. And because of that, I think that the church needs to discern the times we live in and, and begin to pray more and, and, to, and to look and to learn how to read the headlines. What headlines am I talking about? These. These are the headlines that we can look at to, to be able to determine what's going on in the times that we're living in. See, when I look at these headlines... Then I look up to what's going on. It makes sense. But if I look at those headlines, then I get confused and anxiety comes. You see, in fact, they say now that people are committing suicide at a greater rate than ever before right now because of the anxiety that's coming on. You know, the, the Bible says that in the last days, men's hearts would fail them because of the things that's coming upon the earth, especially as we go into the tribulation period. So Satan has been ruling from the air, but all of a sudden... At least for the third heavens, we know his clearance has been downgraded. 
and his access has been denied. That's what's happened. He knows his time is almost up and he no longer can eavesdrop on the plans of God in the heavenlies like he did in the book of Job chapter one where he was called, he was able to come and join the other sons of God at the sons of God conference in, in, the, in heaven and, and have a conversation with God. All of that's over with. Michael said, nope, you got to go. <laughs> so now he's on the earth. So woe to those who dwell on the earth Jesus said of the tribulation period, if he didn't return, no flesh would survive. It's going to be a time like never seen before. So it says now in verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, and I believe there are hints of some of his advantages which have been taken away uh, in, in even his ability to rule. So now he's scrambling. Notice what he does. He immediately, it says in verse 13, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Well, it's not like he hasn't been persecuting Israel throughout time. Remember, the woman is Israel. But now he throws everything he has at her. In fact, it says the, the, the meaning of this word persecute is really interesting. It means to mistreat to harass and trouble and even molest someone with all hostility. And so Satan is coming with all hostility now against this woman. And you have to understand, when you begin to think about the motives behind persecution, there's, a, there's several reasons why Satan persecutes Israel and Satan even today persecutes the church. Although, as we're reading in chapter 12, the church is in heaven with the Lord. OK, but the reason he persecutes the body of believers may sometimes only be because we are the beloved of the father. In other words, I don't think Satan really needs any major reason other than the fact that you were loved by the Lord and because you're loved by the Lord therefore he wants to persecute you so Jesus says in this life you will have tribulation but in this world you have tribulation be of good cheer I've overcome the world I want to remind you of something you know because I think my word to the church in America that I any anytime I get, get the chance to speak is that we need to understand the scripture says that we're not going to make this world better but that this world is headed in a direction and God is going to judge the world in fact, here's the thing that Jesus said in John chapter 15, and these are things that most Christians in most countries around the world already know, but the American church is needing to wake up to. John chapter 15, verse 18 through 21 says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. You get that? It's very, in other words, if you belong to the world, the world would love you. Something about you, it makes it very evident that you no longer belong, okay? And it, it says, this, uh, so he says, as, oh Lord, where was I at? Verse 19, yeah, if you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. So Jesus has chosen us out of the world, and the world knows this. So he goes and say, that is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus says, they will persecute you also. Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Jesus said, they're going to simply persecute you because of my name, because I love you, and you are no longer of the world. I've chosen you out of the world. The Bible says that when we believe the gospel of our salvation, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And at that very moment, you are no longer of this world that you currently live in. Part of the friction and the issues that we as believers have sometimes is that our flesh loves the world and the things of it, and, and we forget but we're no longer of it. We are citizens of a new kingdom. We have to conduct ourselves as such. Does that make sense? And the American Christians need to begin to learn that because for so long, we have been blessed to not experience the persecution that our brothers and sisters in almost every other country that, that I could name now have experienced, even to death. 260 million Christians worldwide, worldwide persecuted. And so... We got to begin to think about this for a moment. What this means is that those who are of the world system, 
which do things that are contrary to the heart of the Father, those are the ones that the, that, the, that the little God of this world, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, who now works in the sons of disobedience, he works in their hearts, in their minds to do things that they don't even understand, even bring in persecution against the church. So we understand Islam is killing Christians. We understand that Hindus this year are killing Christians. We understand that the Communist Party of, 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 of uh, China, they are persecuting Christians. And so this year, America begins to get a little taste, just a tiny bit of taste of it, that those who would make laws that will, will fund through tax dollars more abortion, that will fund through tax dollars rights and health care for LGBTQ and the advancement of those lifestyles that would uh, make homo that free sex more um, available, even including pedophilia, and, the, and that would make the access to drugs, illegal drugs, more easy, easier to get to. I didn't tell you this last week, but the government officials of California, and this came to me from a pastor in California, that you know they put the homeless people in hotels during the lockdown, right? We understand that. And of course, they trashed the hotels, but that was to be expected. But what we didn't know and what mainstream media would never tell you is that they gave the homeless people illegal drugs so that they would stay in the hotels. So they gave them meth and things like that to keep them from actually leaving the hotels because a drug addict ain't going to stay in a hotel without drugs. Okay. Um, and so we see all of this type of mentality going on amongst our liberal policymakers. And then that, with all of that, they're fine, fining pastors with fines and taking property from churches and harassing. Persecution starts with simple harassment of the church in America. Can you imagine that for a moment? Goodness. Because they're led by the prince of the power of the air. So now, verse 13, the dragon knows his time is short here and he's been cast through the earth. So he just simply with everything he has, persecutes the woman. But I want to I now look at in verse 14 how that begin, begins to unfold. Y'all stay with me. I'm going to try to pick up my pace. So he's, he's persecuting the woman that gave birth to the male child. But the woman, notice, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Interesting verse. So she's given two wings as a great eagle. Pastor Kevin, what is it talking about? Well, if we've identified the nation of Israel as the woman, right? Then it'd be hard to fathom how a nation can all of a sudden sprout wings and fly off. That doesn't make natural sense, right? It's okay. It doesn't make sense, right? Y'all awake? Okay. All right. And so then here's where we got to look at this from a figurative perspective. It's, it's, it's something that he wants us to interpret to gain an understanding of what's going on here. And if I look to scripture, I begin to find out that this is not the first time that God has made this type of an illusion. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 on the screen, it says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He's speaking of when he delivered the nation of Israel from its, its slavery in Egypt. Remember, he didn't give them wings. It's figuratively speaking of how speedily and how amazingly he protected them. How did he do it? Well, he sent the deliverer. Satan eavesdropped in heaven that it was happening. So he killed all, he got Pharaoh to kill all the boys, but God supernaturally protected one because his parents um, were moved with godly fear, put the boy in a basket, sent him down the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter finds him. She couldn't nurse him. They send for a Hebrew woman to come nurse him. So his sister goes and gets his mom and the mom comes and gets paid for nursing her son because God had a plan that Satan couldn't throw. He couldn't, he couldn't throw that plan. You follow me? Amen. Okay. This is what scripture tells us. Okay. So, so he prepares this deliverer over time and God is long suffering. So then some probably 80 years later, Moses shows up. Hey, God says, let my people go or it's about to go down. And that's literally what happened. 
Pharaoh hardened his heart against God, so God hardened his heart to seal the deal, and the plagues began to fall upon the nation of Egypt. Y'all know this stuff, right? Okay. Uh, so by the time it was all said and done, Egypt was smoking and stinking. <laughs> Dead frogs and cattle everywhere. Um, Nile River turned to blood. Fish are dead. The place is, is, is devastated. The firstborn has been killed. Only those who applied the blood in obedience and faith were spared. And then Israel leaves with the wealth going out of Egypt. Pharaoh pursues. God uses pillars of fire to hold Pharaoh off, parts the water. Israel leaves across and Pharaoh's army is drowned in the Red Sea. God says, I bore you on eagle's wings. I gave you flight and I took you out of there. You get the picture? Likewise, during the tribulation, when Satan puts everything he has and turns it towards persecuting the woman, likewise, God is going to give the woman two wings here, it says, and he is going to deliver her. And, and notice he gives her two wings. I'm going to come back to that, that she might fly into the, into the wilderness to her place. And it's interesting to begin to think about that. She's going to fly into the wilderness. Where is she going? And he calls it her place. Well, listen, historically in Scripture, the wilderness from Israel's standpoint would be to the uh, east, if you will, and south. Prophetically, it's also to the east and south. In fact, Daniel describes during this time that there is a particular place which points maybe to Jordan. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 41 and 42 on your screen, it says, He, Antichrist, he shall also enter the glorious land, that's Israel, and make and many countries shall be overthrown. He's going to have the power as a world leader to overthrow countries. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Speaking of the area of Jordan, it says, and he shall stretch out his hand against, notice, the countries. And the land of Egypt, he says, shall not escape. And this is, this is a very interesting prophecy because as I look at this, it almost seems as though God narrows down where the wilderness is going to be for us to get an idea. Because here's the thing. The north is cut off for Israel, according to scripture, because the nations from the, earth, from the north are going to invade her. They are her enemies. So in modern times, Turkey right now is Israel's enemy, aided by Iran, who's aided by China, and also Russia is involved. So the north is cut off. Antichrist is going to deal with Egypt. So what's left? The ones that will be spared, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon, which is Jordan. So even in modern times right now, Jordan is friendly with Israel. They have good peace ties and nominal relations with one another. Saudi Arabia has just opened up her airspace. And also in the far southeast is the uh, United Arab Emirates, which now has a normalized relationship, uh, relationship with Israel as well with their peace talks. In fact, this week, they're going to be signing the peace deal, expecting other Arab nations to join in. Some of y'all know this stuff, right? As it seems like everything that God has been saying is coming to pass, at least the framework moving in that direction. And so it seems that historically, prophetically, and even now in the modern view of things, if it happened today, Israel would most likely flee to the east and south. And most scholars for many years have believed that the place that Israel would flee to in the wilderness was the rock city of Petra because it is a, is a, is a place that's in the mountains, very well protected, and um, it's, it's carved into the rocks. How many of you have looked at Petra online before? How many of you have been to Petra? Anybody in here have been to Petra? Okay. Beautiful. They even have an amphitheater that can see the 30,000 people that are carved, buildings that have been carved out. And it's very wonderful. If you watched um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, was it that one? No. And it wasn't that one. The Holy Grail one? Well, y'all have seen the movies. The one with the... Y'all, he went to Petra in one of them. Okay. The Last Crusade. Thank you, Risa. Thank you. I said, no, I got them all. Yes. Uh, I watched them all. That's right. Okay. And so they go there. And so that's a possibility. He gives them two wings here to fly into the wilderness. I just want to help you understand something, too, as we, as we interpret Bible prophecy. You know, we sometimes can get stuck in what we think is going to happen. And then the closer we get to it, the reality of what's actually happened becomes clearer. 
especially after more things have been fulfilled. For all we know, what could happen is that Israel's going to load up on planes and fly to the United Arab Emirates. We don't really know. What we know is that God has a place, notice, prepared. Notice she's going to fly into the wilderness to her place. And so what we need to understand is that Israel is going to take refuge. They're going to be refugees for the last three and a half years in another land because they rejected their Messiah. Jesus says, I come in my father's name and you don't believe me, but another will come in his own name. And you'll believe him. They're going to believe the Antichrist and they're going to see him as Messiah as the temple is being built and he is aiding them in all of this stuff. And as they cry peace, by the way, they're currently crying peace and safety right now. The Bible says sudden destruction comes upon them. And so what we need to understand is that God has a place prepared for Israel for the last three and a half years. Once they realize in this three and a half year mark, two things happen. Number one, on earth, there's the abomination of desolation. The Bible says that when that happens in the book of Daniel, he gives us the exact amount of time that will be left until, until everything ends. And also number two is that Satan gets kicked out of heaven. And so what it looks like that has happened here is that abomination has taken place. Satan has been kicked out of heaven. The Jews realize that they try trusted the wrong Messiah and they they bail they leave because he's persecuting them heavenly heavenly and God has a place notice prepared for them notice he calls it her place how can he call it her place why does it say that it's because God who stands outside of time knowing the end from the beginning and knowing everything that would happen remember this is written a long time ago and so much of it has already been fulfilled that we know it's true. We know it's God's word. And because of that, he already knew what was going to happen. So he has already prepared a place for Israel while she's going through her difficult time. And, and, and this is what we got to take from that. It's special for us to realize that because that means that God has never abandoned or left Israel whom he made many promises to, which means that we can trust God to also keep every promise that he's made to us. And he has special things ahead of us in the future. We know that. Amen. And so when you're going through intense times and persecution from the enemy, even in those times, God, if you will, has a place prepared in uh, for a way of escape. In the book of First Corinthians, I'm just going from memory, chapter 10. The Bible says, uh, let the one who takes heed uh, let the one who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. In other words, if you think you're doing all right, you need to humble yourself and turn to the Lord before you fall. He says that because no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common amongst men. And God, with that temptation, will always make a way out. I'm paraphrasing it. Go look at it. That you may be able to bear up under it. And so even in your most horrific, the word is temptation, but it also is translated trial. In whatever trial, persecution you might be going through, God makes a way of escape. There's always a way if we look to him and not our own understanding. And so here she flees to the wilderness where she is nourished, no, taken care of for a time, notice, singular, and times, notice, plural, and a half a time. We see this in the book of Daniel as well. A time, that's a year. Time, that's one year, by the way. Times, plural, that's two years. And a half time is a half a year. So we got three and a half years is what it's saying here. Earlier, we looked at this early on in the chapter. In verse 6, it says the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Notice that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So that tells us exactly that we're talking about three and a half years if you do your math. You with me? So now we're in the second half of the tribulation as we're reading. Okay? And notice she's going to be nourished there from the presence of the serpent. In other words, she will be protected in this place prepared by God in the wilderness so Satan can't get at her for the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And there she will meditate on the scriptures and realize who her Messiah is. And when Jesus returns, Isaiah gives this illusion of Jesus coming from the east with his garments dyed red as he's been treading out the, the grapes of wrath, if you will. And he is fighting the Antichrist, destroying his army and bringing his people with him to Jerusalem where he arrives and he will set his foot on the Mount of Olives, according to Zechariah. Y'all know? Y'all OK? Yes. Now, look at this next part. This is extremely important. Verse 15. 
So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he may cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And stop for a minute. So Satan is spewing water out of his mouth like a flood. What's going on? Well, we think this is figurative to some degree. We see often through the scriptures these things like this. Jesus has coming out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. That's not what's happening. It's a picture of the power and the authority of the word of God, which can divide between the soul and spirit. We understand that, right? Okay. Later in the book of Revelation, Satan's going to, uh, the dragon's going to open his mouth and these, these unclean spirits like frogs are going to come out. All of these things are figurative, speaking of things that, that's going on. So out of his mouth, this flood comes. But there may be a literal uh, lean to this thing. He spews water out of his mouth. Well, it doesn't necessarily come out of his mouth, but somehow he's causing a flood to go after the woman, either of water or a army that's coming after her to destroy her. Whichever one it is, it seems, listen to me for a minute, it seems as though Satan is able to manifest his anger and rage towards the woman in a natural way persecution or a natural trial. Can that happen? Well, I know that when Pastor Dan was here a few weeks ago, he talked about a story where he was getting ready to leave to go on a mission field and that he felt like he was having a heart attack and had to go to the doctor and they tried to keep him for tests and, and all this stuff. And he felt like the Lord says, no, go on your mission trip. He was going to preach the gospel. Meanwhile, he didn't find out until later that at the same time, a woman in another place, y'all remember him telling this story? She, she woke up and she had a vision of him and it looked like somebody was squeezing his lungs. Remember that? And so she began to pray and had a bunch of people begin to pray for him and, 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 and they prevailed through that. And that's a picture. So it's almost as if Satan's attack on him manifested itself physically. It's very interesting. Can this happen? Well, let's look quickly at the book of Job. And I think this is healthy for a church that's going to preach the gospel on the streets this week and be open in the community. Sometimes these things happen in Job chapter 1. If you don't know where it's at, you can listen to me. I'm going to read. In Job chapter 1, we see in verse 13, it says, Now there was a day when his sons, his is Job, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their own oldest brother's house. Everybody's at big brother's house having a nice little family gathering, okay? And a messenger came in verse 14, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. So this particular day is not a, necessarily a good day for Job because these Sabians showed up and robbed him of his goods and killed his servants. Now on the surface, that would just seem like these dudes got up and said, you know, let's rob Job today. But because I read the beginning of the chapter, I encourage you to do, what I know is going on is that Satan has been in a conversation with God and see the one thing I do not like about the book of Job is that God said to Satan have you considered my servant Job I don't like that part because it means that God bragged about Job and then Satan was like well Job only serves you because you give him stuff and you know if you take the stuff from him he'll curse you to your face and so God says okay we'll go test him but you can't kill him so because I read the beginning of the chapter I know that Satan is behind this. In other words, the Sabians then just wake up and decide, let's rob Job. The prince of the power of the air who now works in the sons of disobedience has moved in their hearts because they don't belong to God. So their hearts are open to Satan's manipulation and they decided, or they didn't decide anything. Satan manipulated them and they went and they robbed Job and killed his servants. The Bible says that in the last days, perilous times would come. Men would be robbers and men would be proud and blasphemous and unholy and unloving. And I watch on the news this 13, 14 year old kid robbed this 74 year old lady of her purse and she tried to grab her purse back and he turns around and punches her and knocks her to the ground. I think he's demonically influenced. 
You know, I, I, I'm kind of thinking that in these times we live in, we got to call it what it is. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Satan's involved in that young man's head. That's what it is. It's demonic. The same thing with the guy who shot the five-year-old boy in Wilson, North Carolina. It's demonic. You just call it what it is from now on, okay? Okay, well, it, Pastor Kevin, maybe you're just, you know, a little too spiritual. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. In other words, fire of God because it's kind of a, it's a, uh, it's an act of God. It's a supernatural thing that's going on. You get what I'm saying? So they're saying fire fell down and burned up the sheep, Job, and only I escaped. Now, if I'm Job, this is twice I hear this only I have escaped. I'm about to have a problem with these guys. You know, how, how only you guys get in the way? <laughs> this don't sound right to me, you know? Something's wrong. You guys might be in on this thing. And so, um, but here's what's going on. Two events in one day and fire falling upon Job's sheep and killing his servants. Um, this is a very supernatural event, but because we know the story, we understand that Satan is behind this physical manifestation of this, this storm that has taken out some of his possession. Or maybe Pastor Kevin is just, again, spiritual. Well, notice verse 17, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. All right, I'm going to say, now you stand over there with the first two guys and stay. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. The Chaldeans woke up this day and just decided that they were going to rob Job of his camels and kill his servants. Did that happen? No, because we know the story. No, Satan moved upon the hearts of the Chaldeans to do this. Okay, well, wait a minute. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Remember the family gathering we talked about in verse 13 is where we're back to now. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So put him over with the other three. I got four guys standing over here now so we can talk about this later after. But I want you to notice a storm, a windstorm of some sort, not a hurricane because they would have known that was coming. Well, we, we know, maybe not then. Um, was it some type of a, a tornado? We've seen other types of windstorms even this year, things that just don't even make sense have happened. This storm was a physical manifestation of Satan's wrath and persecution against Job. And it manifests itself in the natural. It's very interesting. And we look at things sometimes it does have a supernatural backing to it. And the people I know from California who are living there now say, and, you know, up and down the West Coast, that the, storm, that the fires that they're seeing this year, even though I've always seen fires on the news in California, to me it doesn't seem like a normal year. And they are saying the same things, you know. And we see these things are happening. But this is how Satan manifested himself against Job and physical attacks, manipulating the hearts and minds of people and causing things to manifest themselves in the natural like storms against Job's people. Y'all with me? Yes. Now, before we go back over to Revelation, I got to end this story so you can know how this ends. Verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on and fell to the ground and cursed God. No, that's right. Good. He fell to the ground and he worshiped. And this is where the, his deliverance comes from. This is why he got into trial and this is why he'll get out. He could have cursed God, but that's not what was in Job's heart. And God only allowed him to be tested because he already knew what was there. And so he worshiped his God. And notice what he says in verse 21. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. By the way, you won't hear the prosperity teachers teach this, this chapter. Naked I came into, uh, from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. 
the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. We're called to sing blessed be the name of the Lord no matter what situation we're in. We don't get to choose when we say blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord because things are working out really good for me. No, blessed be the name of the Lord because he's the author and finisher of my faith. And even if it looks difficult now, I know he's not done. So blessed be the name of the Lord. And at the end of the story, God restores all of Job's possessions and gives him more children, which means that he ends up with double the children at the end of the story as he stayed faithful to God. That's the end of it. I wanted you to know that. But I wanted you to see the physical manifestation of Satan's wrath and his, his manipulation in the realm of men. And so back over in this chapter, he spews this water out of his mouth like a flood to try to cause the woman to be carried away. And we see that happening. And then, listen, the times we live in, just like the Sabians and the Chaldeans back in Job chapter 1, so goes the, the Muslims this year or all the time, the Hindus, the, the, the Communist Party of China, the Democratic Party of America, and many others. And by the way, if you're wondering, I'm unaffiliated politically. I don't want you to think I'm a Republican. I'm not. But I'm not a Democrat either. But I want to be with Jesus and I want to see things for what it is and the only way to do that is to, is to see it having my brain washed by this so my mind can be clear. And that's what's happening here during the last three and a half years. So Satan is, is after the woman. He's spewed water out of his mouth to carry away in a flood. Verse 16, I want to just say a supernatural attack from Satan requires supernatural deliverance from God. In verse 16, we see it. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. I love that. Which the dragon that spewed out of his mouth. How does that happen? We don't know. We know that when Moses was contending with the the apostates, that God opened the earth up and swallowed those that were coming against his, his plan. Um, And so this is some type of a earth shaking event, an earthquake or something of that sort that has happened. And literally the flood was swallowed up so that the woman could go to the place that God had already prepared for her, where she could be nourished for the final three and a half years of the tribulation period so that she could meet her Messiah at the end. Isn't God amazing? Yes, he is. I want to tell you this week as I'm, I'm over time, I'm way over time. This physical manifestation. So this week I had an opportunity to to teach at a pastor's conference. um, And I was, uh, you know, the youngest one, even though all of this is white, I was the youngest one um, having an opportunity to speak, you know. So, you know, I was a little nervous going into the week. And uh, so I went to the hotel on Monday night so I could prep because I had to teach on Tuesday morning. And I had somewhat of a message that I was wrapping up. And I could... It just sense that the, the narrative that the enemy has been putting out into the world this year kind of has, it, it has an effect on the church sometime, you know? And that night I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get any peace. And so my mind was flooded and racing and I couldn't seem to, to calm my mind down. Um, and when I would try to lay down and say, let me rest because obviously I'm not doing well, I'll get up extra early and I would lay down and I had to, I would pop back up. And one time when I was laying down, I could literally, I could hear my heart beating in my, in my ear and I'm not a medical professional. So I assumed that my, my blood was racing or something was going on. My heart must've been really, really pounding for me to be able to hear my heart beating. And I was pacing the hotel and I was trying not to to scare the woman that was working there so she wouldn't call the cops because I paced the whole hotel. Um, I, was, I was out. I was pacing. The people were blasting their phone in the room next to me, so I banged on the door, and I could hear the people who do security here at the church say, Pastor Kevin, you shouldn't be doing that by yourself, but I didn't care. I banged on the door. They never came to the door. Um, I, I was outside the hotel at the, at the, at the uh, picnic table in the, in the parking lot praying, and I'm like, Lord, what is going on? And I couldn't rest. And from, I would say, from about three something in the morning till about six something in the morning, the Lord redid the whole message. When by the time I walked into the church that morning, I had this eerie peace going on. It was strange because I'm like, I don't know what I just went through. 
And my wife was praying the whole time because she could see it, but she couldn't do anything. And the Lord, she said the Lord was telling her, don't, don't, don't bother him, just pray. And so I delivered the message I thought the Lord had, had given, and I, I heard feedback from people that it, it did bless them. It, it eased them from what they were going through. And then as soon as that finished up, it was almost like the enemy came back stronger and attacked my wife physically. And to the point that I, I thought I was going to take her to the hotel, I had to take her to the hospital. You know, it says here in verse 16 that the earth helped the woman, opened up its mouth, swallowed the flood that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And then notice verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. You know, because I thought like what I taught last week, we get the victory, we overcome. I was like, man, I think we got the victory. And then it came back. Now I'm laying hands on my wife and I'm praying and I'm praying and I sent text out to a few and I'm praying and, and, and people are praying. We're praying over my wife. And, and then she felt like, you know, this is not normal what she was feeling, the pain and everything that came. And so um, that subsided after a few hours and we were able to go back and, uh, and be with the people there at the church. But it was just a weird time. You know, <laughs> it's just a weird time. And I think that... Um, as I see this and I'm looking at this and I'm reminded of those times and the things that Pastor Dan shared and uh, what we have coming up Friday as a church congregation. And I think the times that we live in, generally speaking, I think we have to understand that the Lord is with us, but the enemy is against us. But because the Lord is with us, we will be victorious. We will get victory. But listen, I do believe that he's called us to press through difficulties and not turn back okay because there's really no other option now at this point we're pressing through you know the Lord is before us the world is behind us so there is no turning back and this is what happened here he's enraged with the woman but he couldn't get at her because she's being protected by the Lord so notice it says and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He goes to now make war with anyone he can find that's either connected with Israel or, or it has come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the world during that final time. Remember, Jesus says that the tribulation is going to be so bad that unless he returns, no flesh would survive. And I'm over time by almost 15 minutes, so let's pray. <laughs> We're going to end here. Father, we do thank you this morning for what you've done, for moving on the hearts of those who have come to give their life to you this morning, Lord, thank you for that. Lord, thank you for the time we've had, for your word that you've given us, Lord God. I pray now that you would be with us throughout this week, that you would go before us in our cars, our homes, the marketplaces, the, our jobs, uh, even the virtual meetings and classrooms that all of us would be participating in this week to some degree, that you would continue to speak to us, that you uh, would use our lives that you would protect those that are going to be going out to the abortion clinic, Lord. That there would be no harm. I pray, and I, and I would call all of you to pray. Lord, we pray that you would push back the, the deception of the enemy, the darkness that goes and comes with that demonic uh, process of taking the lives of babies, which is just as demonic as offering your kids to pass through the fire to the God of Moloch and the in the Old Testament, Lord. It's the same and even more horrible. So, Lord, as we enter, as our foot uh, touches the, uh, par uh, the parking lot that day, even as we get out of the bed that day, even as we prepare our hearts ahead of time for that day, I pray that you would give us victory against the work of the enemy, that you would give us free passage, Lord God, and that you would open the hearts and the minds of those who are coming that will see and hear the words that we would speak. And then, Lord, that afternoon when we gather at the town square, I pray that you would meet us there, Lord God, and that you would let our, our love for one another, for you, our fellowship, um, the word that will be preached, the, God, the, the worship that would go forth, that it would ring out in our town, Lord, as a sweet sound that would bring peace and hope to those who would hear it, Lord God, that they would be moved to know that there is a God and that he is uh, greater than all the things that we see going on and going wrong in this world. Uh, Lord God, that you would use this body uh, to, to be, uh, uh, to, to glorify you, Lord. And I know that the enemy is seeking to bring division in our church and to try to, uh, to disrupt what you're doing. Uh, Lord, I pray against that now, that if there's any that are, uh, that are trying to do that, Lord God, that you would shut it down and that you would allow your peace to remain. 
uh, Lord God, that you would cause us to learn to love one another, learn to walk together, learn to encourage each other when we come in this place, that we may all go out of this place, Lord God, uh, just ready to serve you and live for you. And so I pray that for everybody here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. God bless you.